general purpose error analysis, I've been on my career. So uh, I am happy. It was sad to say it should be the very last feed kind of analysis that they are right? mm -hmm. uh, able to exist, but it's not the whole CFD point of view. So I'm uh, enjoying the uh, I look back on my year, uh, I was a giant to me. After this, I feel like that one. The people I'm following, I'm a broad sat on the last of them, but there we go. So, what I'm going to talk about here is uh, transport points on models. Now, uh, what this came out of was I was asked to do a, a review paper for the Aero Journal a couple of years ago, the 25th uh, anniversary edition, uh, on uh, industrial wind tunnel testing. And uh, so, what I'll do was transport wind tunnels. And after I got to about 80 pages on a hanging design and built transonic wind tunnels, I thought that was probably getting a bit over the top. So I went back and we looked at some of the basics. So the, uh, the history of what's going on with transonic and just for wind tunnels at minutes. Um, and the first, so what I'm going to talk about, <laughs> confirmation comes out of that. So, first thing really is I'm going to talk about what transonic wind tunnel is. Hopefully, um, I'll go to some of you don't, otherwise I'll talk a couple of minutes, uh, just for definitions of an example or two. Then I'll talk about the amount of supply for wind tunnels and uh, how that's changed in the last few years. Um, a look at actually what's going on in the world, who's doing what, uh, when, in particular, the surprising number of new builds reactivated by the speed of the sea. Uh, and then I'm going to talk about what's happening in the UK. Uh, I'll mention IT all up at the end, that's like the uh, part of the tour. Uh, and I should say, just a disclaimer. These are all my own views. They're not representative of any organization I've ever worked for. Um, I'm currently uh, working for the Cambria Aerospace and they have no interest whatsoever in transonic flights, so I'm not going to upset them. Uh, I shall find not to upset them with my previous deployments. Um, so, first bit then, transonic wind tunnels. Um, what is one? Well, it's a tunnel capable of operating in the transonic range from so 1.7 to 1.4. You can argue about 1.4 to 1.5. The point here, this is still pretty much the most challenging flight regime for both experimental uh, aerodynamics and, and the CFP. But it's also the most useful flight regime for most of our serious flight vehicles are operating. So the safe line is the hardest and the most useful area. That's where we have the least capability. Um, what's the defining? Uh, that's really the, the test sections are ventilated. So we have either perforated walls, uh, lots of holes drilled in the walls, um, and normal of 60 degrees, or we have slotted walls as an ETW, um, which can either be scraped or tapered or have its own backwards. But anyhow, we have holes or slots in the walls, porosities in ranging 3 and 20 percent, depending on what we're doing with the tunnel, and also how old it is. Older tunnels tend to be a bit weaker than new, newer tunnels. We've got a bit better design and test sections over the years. And around that, first of all, like test section, you've got some kind of vegan chamber. And, um, to hold the pressure and don't have the required value. Why do you ventilate the test section? You've got quite a lot of reasons. It's not really covered entirely well. It's like choking, it moves on very quickly. But it's a bit more than that, but the incredible choking, that you prevent shocks forming around the model, as they have a bunch of supersonic tubes of strains around the walls there. But also, you can use Sorted wall to set supersonic flows even without a nozzle. You don't need a, a combat nozzle to get supersonic flows if you've got perforated walls and a little bit of suction. So, for example, in TF, the cryogenic wind tunnel in the States, we'll get to, I think, 1.3, 1.2, 1.3 without conversion divergent nozzle because it's such a little bit. So, you go. Actually, interesting that that was a surprise. If you read back through the literature, when they first were doing transit, they were basically modifying old 1.6. Absolutely enormous high speed, low speed for building. But you have things like the Calistans tunnel was originally a subsonic tunnel, the warehouse to eat bigger motors, and um, hoping to get to say 0.85 or 9 and not having choking. And you could read and you can see that actually going supersonic in those facilities was a complete surprise for them. Um, and we probably did the classic engineering thing of pretending they meant to do that all the time. Uh, that's the thing there, and I've done that as well. Uh, the other thing you can do is you can eliminate all corrections or reduce all corrections at low speeds, and you can play around with the wave rotations of the wall at supersonic speeds. You can't do them necessarily all at once. Inevitably, the real world comes in and the, the optimum velocity of walls changing for each of those is slightly different, but you can run the balance of that. Um, and you can control the inflow and outflow of the test section with suction from the patient. 
and that could be either passive or some kind of system at the back. So you place the dump flow into the yeah, into view, so you can use the inherent suction in the wind tunnel to suck flow out of the SS engine. Or as in the case of AOA, you can put a compressor there and suck flow out of it. In fact, if you're a cow the compressor that we use to suck flow out of the SS section is two or three times bigger than the compressor that's running the tunnel. Um, that's the point. It started off as a map on six tunnel, they didn't call you. A new family by just writing an enormous beam section on press out. So, what are we doing with these wind tunnels? I'll put I'll, these I'll, 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 We're working on civil current civil aircraft. Uh, we're getting things like these are classics, transonic cruise performance, conventional wing aerodynamics, lots of airframe modifications, uh, express and strike, things like that, propulsion system, integration, uh, stability control, military aircraft to get. Surprising number of things we're doing air data, stability control, propulsion, jet effects, intake effects, uh, wind aerodynamics, flight performance, but also kind of unconventional future civil aircraft where you look into more integrated aerodynamics, so you've got integrated wind body aerodynamics, integrated propulsion systems, which makes life really quite clever, flexible structures, so you start to need other models that are matching your fence aeroplane and fighting with them, that they are themselves flexible. Um, and the military aircraft back to, well, people call these unconventional. For those of us who remember the 80s, they're looking like what we were doing back in the 80s and 90s with them, well, I some various things there. Um, but certainly maneuverability, which actually also is a throwback to what I was doing in the 80s and 90s. So perhaps some of these future stuff is actually um, back to the future, back to the 80s. Um, but certainly a bigger uh, emphasis on supersonic performance. And uh, Big one there, I'll check as well as the aerodynamics, the internal moments, that's a, a major, major issue for transonic flight and transonic uh, usage of the development systems. I can't mention spacecraft there. But as I said there, the, the strange thing is that all of these would be absolutely familiar to anybody who was running a transonic for 30, 40 years ago. That really started doing anything to see the difference. We've had a shift away from massive database building, just handle turning testing, to um, looking towards complementary activities of CFD, um, greatly improved data productivity of these facilities now, um, and modern advanced instrumentations of the impact that I've come onto in the bit. On the challenge side is that, as you will see, most of the transatlantic ensembles in the world are kind of getting a bit elderly, to say the least. And so, lots of these facilities or degradation of existing facilities can be a major issue. In those countries that aren't prepared to spend the money on them. So, I think, oh, actually, I'll just give you just an example of some pretty pictures of tunnels that are playing transonic tunnels. So, think rigs, uh, jet effects. Um, but that's still a bit of a big uh, feature of transonic testing for military aircraft, which have a problem with flow and you take notes, and also the solution to challenging kind of notes by cost. Um, Dynamic testing, we're not doing much of that anymore, I'm not doing any, but the Indians and the Chinese are spending a lot of time there doing dynamic testing. Transform wind tunnels, um, Heller interactions, that's a 400 m model of ARA. Um, some more uh, high alpha steam air rigs, um, aerolatic models, that's the transform dynamics tunnel in the States there, with wire mounted air models, aerolatic testing, um, stores release, where we have a, uh, a six knot model support system. Um, uh, you know, so we can move to store at six degrees of freedom relative to the parent aircraft. Uh, that's the, uh, the two string rig that was at ARA, but most rounds on the wind tunnels, very significant have got a rig, something like that. Uh, lots of half bottle stuff. Uh, after body models, typically see if you want to be active on the thing interference, that one as well in civil aircraft. Um, high alpha missile testing, still surprisingly popular. I will be come on again recently. It's the size of the crops in the UK. But a lot of crop test facilities are all in it. By the teeny tiny tunnels, all they're mostly for both. Um, and there's some of the done intake tests. And that again is a, a very common, if we more common in some respects, would be an intake flow is not now on military aircraft. But we'll also see that coming in on future civil aircraft because we're looking at more integrated uh, propulsion systems. We've got bangle air swallowing intakes. So all of these things, the intake. Well, uh, interactions with the, with the aircraft that I've done, so we've got more complex. And I'll still be seeing very difficult to predict. So that's sort of rigs. 
I'm still at classification. This is what goes through That's a lot of what I talk about in terms of where we are with wind tunnels comes down to basically size. I think it's a more, in a way, it's a more useful classification for transonic tunnels because the speed, they're all transonic. Reynolds number, it all depends on pressure you're putting in. The size really tells you about how complex, how sophisticated this would be used. And, um, and it generally correlates most directly to the kind of the level of technology and uh, complexity of work that you're doing in, in terms of technology readiness level. So I've got this um, personal uh, classification. Always, there's always, from a bit of knowledge to this side, I've had quite a lot of discussions with Andre, who got very upset about that my classification is smaller than search. I think it's a, one of my problems that should not have been in this classification, and I should change my paint and I'm not saying that I'm not looking for this one. Never mind. So small research tunnels, set for nine inch test section, mid range industrial tunnels, CRL three to five, four foot uh, test section there. What I would call large industrial, ARA, nine foot by uh, eight foot. And then I imagine to be the very large industrial tunnel, the, uh, the 16 foot tunnel of the world, eight meter S1 MA, um, as you can see there. And I've deliberately chosen the picture of the people standing there. I'm terribly sorry there are very few women in these pictures because um, there just aren't that many photographs. The less the shockingly sexist ones that we get from NASA back in the 70s. There's one NASA engineer, we already decided they would take photographs of her in the mid tunnel today. They dressed her up in the 60s, uh, Dr. Burke, yeah, really quite, uh, quite poor me, so I didn't want to use those. And he's a bit of a mixing. But the physical person, the test engineer, I think it's the physical significant thing. Why basically, if you can get into the test section, it's an industrial tunnel. That's exactly every university tunnel. If you can stand up in it, it's a large industrial tunnel. That's it. They're very, very fast about these things. So, what does this translate to in terms of what these big tunnels look like? Well, again, I said four foot is an industrial That's I don't know, me on my knees, but at least I can get into it and work on the model. Uh, and what I've talked here is uh, maximum and math number against test section size. Uh, as a first step. Uh, and so we've got a test section reference link, that's a square root for the area. From our table, all the ones below the port foot, there's a lot of um, toy tunnels in there, up to you know, six foot. They're maximum map number running up to the uh, map five, max six, but that's the biggest you get. Some of them also have a transonic capability. Anything faster than that tends to be pure supersonic. Because you start to need things like heaters to stop the FDA uh, uh, actually liquefying your test section, you don't need it. So they become uh, a different kind of facility. Um, there are kind of two areas in here, two typical kinds of workhorse wind tunnels. We've got what I call a mid range trisonic flow down. We can refer to it as trisonic because I've run anywhere from um, subsonic to uh, low hypersonic, back to the back, 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 back there. And these are almost all flow down tunnels with the ability to pump up, big tank of air, over the valve, blow air through it for 15, 20 seconds, and then wait an hour to be moving in the house again. Uh, so that's Typically, that's the Canadian, uh, I thought at 1.5 meters, they have 1.5 foot. Um, and that's a, a classic example of these facilities. I know are dozens of these around the world, and they're an absolute workforce of other uh, commercial organizations run these facilities. And then this down here, we have large transonic continuous. So we've got an interlink, low down, area at one end, area at the other end, and we've got our classical continuous on the land. These tend to be uh, a bit bigger. They don't go much past, they don't, they don't go up to about 1.5, 1.6 at most, because like the start being populated above that, and you don't need it to get too expensive. And um, we're typically sitting between two and three meters because of the So that's what I call work on some of this. And there are other ones that are the of unusual ones there. Um, now, so that's the kind of tunnels we have. What are we doing with them now? Because this is a very good question. Mm -hmm. Oh, what do you want to do? Um, because once you start looking at numbers, Actually, wind tunnels essentially they're never been busier. So, what I've done here is plotted um, occupancy hours per program. So, per flight vehicle program, user occupancy hours in the tunnel. Um, and that was this plotted. So, we've got wind tunnel hours against the earth. And uh, I'll, I'll, I'll change it here. It's a lot of off of the vertical scale, which you have a lot of change scenes. Uh, but what you've got there is the right side down there. So, you uh, tens of hours. You get to the DC1 in the 30s, which is when people first start to be in the complete configurations. You get a nice round up through the four years, and then you get to about the 1980s, and it levels off at about 20,000 hours per program. So the numbers of winter hours per program, actually, the last 
30 years hasn't changed that much, except for that 10 for the federal pay for the down balance. At the same time, though, connectivity has ramped up rapidly. So, back in the 60s, we'd be looking to get one or two poles an hour. Pretty much still looking at people on the right and stuff down my hand. Uh, and then, as we've gone through, we can see that connectivity has gone by a factor of five to ten at times. So there's a misconception that test practices um, compromises and data quality, but it's mostly instrumentation there. Um, and so you get to that point now where the hours drop off, the data points per hour keep going up. So what you could say there is that the data points per program has carried on ramping up all that time and still shows actually no sign of letting it on. Although it's quite difficult to get in more recently. Oh, we're just telling. Um, but the other issue is that point where things leveled up. That's about the point at which people first start to say, we're going to do it all with computers in 10 years' time. Uh, so, I think this was, I don't know if anybody had any point this event. Um, then we'll come back to me, I'm getting to the age when they need to disappear into the images in the midst of times. Uh, but anyhow, this is SP67 in the, uh, in the about 75, wind tunnels will be second to be in 10 years' time. And they've been saying that since. Uh, and obviously, that really has not happened. So that's why we leave them in a way that the people who build their plants are still testing them and they're still busy. You can't get into a transfer for a couple of years if you think most of the countries have been They are taxed, they are full, their programs are full. But what have we actually got to test in? So, this is your side of it is okay, people want to test the plants, but surely they are dying trees. Um, they are, again, there was a quote from one of the automotive people, uh, dinosaurs of engineering. But anyhow, I will split them into continuous and intermittent tunnels. So we've got continuous circuits, um, generally transonic, um, high levels of power, so expensive things to run. ARA is a good example 30 megawatts to run ARA. That's about half the power usage in bedroom. 40 years ago, it was the entire power needs to be paid for, they produced the brown house. If you, if you started up the input, on the uh, 30, and ARA is at the same time, the local grid uh, will stop on you. So, you know, you to... so these are generally transonic, low supersonic. And the other thing with these is because they're relatively expensive, they're usually operated by national research organisations, usually. And that excludes those purely supersonic tunnels. If I'm looking just at transonic tunnels, you can put ventilated walls. So this is Test section size plotted against entry into service. So the blue, the fill symbols are tunnels that are still running, the red symbols are tunnels that are closed. Yeah? And I've got a couple of shaded ones over here, which will come back to the blue, which are tunnels, new projects that are either in construction or about to start construction. So let's just sort of the names on there. And what's this down here? Down A, Jackster, or Sound East, and we see that we the end. Uh, I'm going to come back to the distribution a little bit as a fake thing, but just to point out what's the interest of tunnels. We've got of all of those, there is one heavy gas tunnel, one of the nitrogen, mountain testing. Um, we've got two completely independent commercial facilities, like they are there in Palestine. You notice they are almost the same size, they're built pretty much the same time. We have three hydrogen wind tunnels. As of last time I gave this presentation, there were two. Well, I've since discovered the Chinese are halfway through building their version of DTW slide figure. Other than that, it's the exact same. That's half built, but you can actually see it on Google Earth. Um, I'll come back to that one there. Yeah, so that's after I have tunnels. So that's the continuous tunnels. Then the other ones, the intermittent work of tunnels. Again, these are taller, generally trisonic, usually below down, operating from high pressure. Fewer such down where you basically dump the area from back to back. Uh, but below average, it's yeah, simpler. And they're usually back three to five. Uh, that's not there. So again, same thing. Reference length. Yeah, it's time when you can sit there. So they're smaller and they're scattered pretty evenly over the last uh, uh, over the last 70 years. Again, filled uh, is operational. Red is closed. You can see actually there's not. It's starting to um, the operational ones are starting to outnumber the closed. So this is there. And again, they tend to be operated by a mix of research organisations. And air framers. And we just built two big for universities, very few university operating facilities. There was one, 
Uh, North American gave their seven foot tunnel to American University. They ran it in Michael Washington, they ran it for a few years, but then they sold them back to some of the bills. So, yeah. Yeah. That is pretty much the only large trisonic blowout tunnels that ever found a permanent thing. Let's put them all together. So, this is transonic wind tunnels of the world. Um, took me about six months to get that for It's amazingly difficult. I can track like wind tunnels are built from where they go. Uh, and it's not close at all, and particularly chances and seizures. So, again, reference length against time, open is, is shut. I didn't find out that one. Again, open symbols are not running anymore, closed symbols are still operational. And we can pick out some classifications for various categories. We've got small research tunnels sitting down here, sort of things you get in universities and air framers uh, below where, let's say, 0.1 meters and above, so say nine inches and above. We've got what I call mid range intermittent tunnels. These are our workhorse, four foot trisonics. We've got our large continuous tunnels, our workhorse ARAs. And then we've got a handful of very large tunnels. You can see most of those very large tunnels were built in the early days of transforming tunnels. There's no one who could afford to move them again. There is one there. There we go. The Chinese are boxed, certainly have published design studies on a five meter transonic continuum. A 16 foot equivalent. Uh, given their record, I've no doubt that they will start building that very soon. Um, in terms of time, there are, you can pick out three generations of these industrial tunnels. We've got what you could call post war pioneers. First, trans appeared in the early days of the war, people started modifying existing tunnels, but then you've got this first of them, building new tunnels. Mostly in, in the States, but quite also in Russia and in Europe. Um, and a lot of this is when really the big tunnels were built. Um, then you've got a bit of a gap, and you've got a bunch of new technology tunnels that ECWs uh, and the like of this world here, T1500 in, in Sweden, in the kind of 1980s, 1990s. Then you've got an interregnum, you've got a gap when people were closing the tunnels and checking peace into them. Uh, and then here in the last 10, 15 years, the third generation of tunnels are starting to appear. We can see it here, we're starting to see these tunnels here, new mid range tunnels, a few large continuous tunnels appear in the last few years. And the other interesting thing really is when you look at the mid range to large tunnels, these tunnels just do not die. Very big ones, you can see several of those have disappeared, but when you come down to these tunnels here, the useful industrial tunnels, once you get past the early 50s, the kind of first generation of tunnels disappeared. But then you've got tunnels, you didn't always see that one, that's the seventh, but that disappeared. This one, it closed, but then it magically reappeared again. That's, that's uh, T1500 in Sweden. Beautiful closed loop, intermittent tunnel, ejector driven, uh, beautifully built by Swedish Independent B, uh, and it was moved to Korea. And it's now in South Korea, it started to be like, shifted out there four or five years ago, and coming again in South Korea. Um, which is which is uh, which is something nice. It's nice to see something come back from the day. Because in the Europe, it's something that's quite nice in my life. So, clearly, this that's a, a bit of a scattered problem. But what do the actual numbers look like? You start putting the numbers, putting together the ones that opened, the ones that closed, when they closed, look at the population. Uh, and this is really just on the industrial tunnels, because the small ones, it's really it's almost impossible. Find out when universities open or close their tunnel. They just don't tell you, they just disappear gently. <laughs> Glasgow Tunnel, for example, Glasgow, Belfast has a um, um, I suppose that we didn't ask them what happened to before they said, Yeah, well, we, we started a couple of years ago. Uh, but there was no announcement you were sitting up. The, often these things still appear on their website years after they've gone. Uh, or in some cases, years before they even exist. Uh, <laughs> uh, Glasgow, I'm thinking of you. But the numbers were actually, this is the bit I was quite surprised by. So there we go, this is continuous tunnels, the world population. And you can see they start in post war, we've got this innovation period where the 50 and 60 of these big tunnels built in a very short period of time. Then things are fairly static, it's a mature technology. Um, we do have new technology tunnels here. And then we get to this the kind of the, um, the bonfire of the tunnels, uh, where here in the UK, in particular in the States, we close a number of these, uh, these large conditions. This is the death of the eight foot, the death of the barn of the transcontinent tunnel, and the US and so on. But then, 
staggering up. She then <coughs> start to reappear. We put intermittent slots after that. That's slightly different. They came along a bit later. If you think of intermittent on the to build on the tube, it would actually go about five to ten years after them. But a similar kind of behavior, the initial growth spurt, a bit of a pattern. But then, from the mid 70s, the numbers just kept going up. People just kept building these funnels and they never closed them. They, every, every, that's part of one. Essentially, every single one of those tunnels that were built is still running. Uh, and then we only had not quite so much of that at the bad time in the, uh, the early 2000s. And then suddenly we were getting real numbers of parts of there. So um, you put them all together, that's the, the tunnel pop, the industrial transplant with all population of the world. But you can see, certainly, one thing you can definitely say, they're not dying. Uh, there is no sign whatsoever of the death of the wind tunnel on stuff high speed. And you can see here that. Um, when we get to the last 15 years, the numbers are just going up year on year. Basically, a new wind tunnel every year in that country. And they are appearing in Korea, and, uh, mostly in China, India, are at the moment building a new low down uh, spatial surgery organization that I think might be four out of five foot and not entirely sure. Uh, and the scariest one appeared in Pakistan somewhere here with the Chinese market built for that. There's one mention on the that tunnel, so it's a bit mysterious. Uh, and we're probably going to be seeing uh, at least one more time in Turkey uh, in, the next, in the next few years as well. And plans to go there, try some tunnel, and possibly even a continuous transfer across the long time there. So, this is what I'd call the 21st century Renaissance. The last 10 years, people have started building brand new, building well equipped, well respected wind tunnels. They're not just toys, they are serious facilities, and they're standing in all the money. So that's where we're going. So kind of the, the good news. And another way of looking at it is looking at the people who operate this particular so What I've got up here is an organization called SCAI, the Supersonic Tunnels Association, which is kind of a trade body for people who operate supersonic tunnels. It's basically a bunch of old school tech engineers get together twice a year um, to commiserate with each other about things they've broken. Uh, <laughs> it's one of the most useful meetings I've ever been to because you actually learn stuff. And you learn that you're not quite as bad as the jobs you thought you were. Um, and you learn how to fix things, you know how to fix. Um, so, I know it's also high grade. Basically, it's a job in twice a day. Everyone has to, in order to stay in, you have to do a technical presentation. Every member has to put a technical presentation every other meeting. So, you have to talk about something all the time, um, which is, which is, which is uh, a great giant. It's actually come up with something interesting on a regular basis. And it's a great place to send your testing videos to as well. And this is, so look what numbers are, compare them with the numbers of wind tunnels. This is just on chance of wind tunnels, a previous plot. Uh, and then I'm going to put the STI membership on. And this is kind of interesting again, it plateaued about the time we stopped building very new tunnels. In the 60s, everybody who had a supersonic tunnel uh, joined the organization and was happy to work in way. We then get again to the, the 90s, and the membership just drops off, which carries on dropping away. Year on year from the 90s to about 2010. And then, about the same time as tunnels start reappearing, the membership starts ramping up again. So people are starting not just the tunnels, I mean, but all the other organizations, the universities, the research organizations are getting bothered enough about high speed testing to get involved again in the international communities that work on these things. Um, so, yeah. Okay, Yes, the 21st century members is there. And I should mention there, most of the European operators and members have been continuous members all the way through. ARA and BAE kind of got born and dropped out. Dell obviously disappeared out of it completely in about 2000. But ARA finally got back in 2017 and BAE just got back in this year. So, so even our own commercial organizations have finally thought, well, actually, you would like to talk to other people and uh, do this sort of thing. Uh, so can we open that? Well, who is doing this? Where? Um, I'm not going to spend much time on this because it's a bit of a boring table. It's just some of my comfort. But the one thing there is to know, the USA still has most of the tunnels, but China is catching up very quickly. Uh, one of the things that comes out here is just countries that have active military aircraft projects have, tend to have two industrial transonic scale wind tunnels to operate with. The only acceptance, we are India and Turkey, but they're catching up. Also, again, companies operating tend to have a supporting infrastructure 
ecosystem of small research facilities, universities, and national research organizations. Exceptions there are Turkey, South Korea, and the UK, that's South Korea. They have got ADP, so it's not quite true. Um, and again, I mentioned this, that most countries have a national research organization to back all of this work up. Uh, a Bidlerian example, Israel is a difficult one because they, they, what they have is like, it's, it's a, it's a company, but it really is a government organization. But the other glaring example there is the UK. We don't have a decent infrastructure to support these bigger facilities, and we don't have a national research organization to back them up. We've got this. We've got DSDL, ATI, EPSER, but they have not in any way whatsoever replaced the actively with the support that we have from IE um, and Derek in its, its early days in this respect. Looking around the world, though, there's a big but the big uh, player game now is China. So we're looking at new wind tunnels in the last 20 years. We have in China, what have we got? FL26, 1999, Swedes in there. That's a copy of TK, you know, we've got built by the Swedes for them. Um, 2.4 meter intermittent. Uh, FL, really, two levels, a 2.2 flow down. They didn't get around to building their first continuous transonic wind tunnel until 2003, 7.6 meter tunnel. Then we've got 1.2 meter blowdown. Then we've got 1.6, uh, so 0.6 meter continuous pilot. We've got another trisonic blowdown. Got another pilot continuous tunnel. We've got, well, we're starting to get more excited now. We've got a trisonic and um, 0.6 meter big range research tunnel. Then we've got FL62 came online about two or three years ago. That's an ARA equipment, set higher pressure. Um, so we'll try and get cleaner. Um, we have Currently under construction, that's what the number is, we didn't have one yet, but this is part of the fire tunnel, that is pretty much a direct copy of the UK government. One percent of paper out there on and even if they did the model support systems, the car running to all the like to take some photo of that by five percent. And this is this is Google Earth. And there is the uh, here's the plants going up, and this is identical to the ETW layout, and there's part of the circuit coming up there. So uh, uh, if anyone's interested, I can find it all, but it's even other And I think it's a impressive there, it's on the side there. And they've also got in planning five meter tracks on the floor. That stuff was published uh, last year as a design study for that. Uh, so this is design study for this within a year of building it. So I expect to see something like this start to appear on the ground in the next couple of years. So they built us for 20 years, seven industrial scale wind tunnels, transonic wind tunnels. I'm not even counting the hypersonic and supersonic, so there's three or four more of those. And it's got too complicated to get them all in. And they built four mid range research tunnels. The rest of the world, all put together, we have um, the Australians' uh, new but not new wind tunnel. This is kind of their old transonic wind tunnel, but it's got a new test section, new research circuit. A uh, new fan, uh, new plan is in the same building, but it's sort of the same. It's sort of as far as they can't be people. So, uh, so that's a point eight meter uh, continuous. We've got uh, a little one in Brazil, 0.3 meter. We've got a reactivated TGF, 0.6 meter trisonic there uh, in the States. Um, we've got a reactivated flow down. This is Lockheed's, it used to belong to Lockheed, I think. Uh, some of these trisonic wind tunnels have been through two or three companies. This was sold to Singapore and moved out there in 2005. Um, another little one in Mississippi, five <laughs> small, but still um, significantly bigger than anything in the UK. Uh, a mysterious one in Pakistan, uh, made, maybe now in 2008. Uh, Iran has a trisonic uh, 0.6 meter tunnel. But this was this is real old school. They've got three, I think it's two or three jet engines running this, which is. Uh, reminds me of the world, I think um, Armstrong Whitworth, that might have been out there, or something like that back in the 50s, uh, when their suit on some sort of three ghosts, uh, and then the other uh, that. Uh, we've got uh, a polysonic tunnel at uh, Forex State, this is where DSL do uh, some of their hypersonic testing now because they have been in the UK to test it. So Trevor will be out there every now and then. Uh, we've got uh, a new one in France, and look. 4.3 meter tunnel at ISA, which you want like to start working there. We've got um, Korea's AD50, uh, C1500, which is a, re a reactivation. Uh, and we've got another sort of reactivation in Arizona that's taken some of these old supersonic tunnels, so uh, trisonic 
and uh, some of the best things in the world. Not sure we've actually run it yet. There's lots of grandiose words on that website. No sign yet from the actual tunnel. Yeah, uh, and then we've got over at ISRO, the English Space Research Organization. Uh, they've got a one point two million below that. And uh, they are at least putting the attack from the of that. And that's the best picture I've got so far. So we've got four industrial scale tunnels, but small, and uh, eight minutes social. And the number of these upgrades got this. So that's kind of where we are. So the people building tunnels, the Chinese are building the rest of us. Uh, go, but there is some activity in, in the West as well. And uh, one thing I just took it here is it's all one of the reasons why we came more centrally to the team we've got nice and solid. Uh, so we're getting something else to do is that we're getting better integrating experimental thermodynamics and computational thermodynamics. This is still a bit of an issue because the two communities don't have really much to work together. Uh, and particularly their funding streams don't work that well together. Um, so we get something you see happening in countries with research organizations, the JAPs are doing this sort of thing. It's got a national strategy of organization. We can pull this together. Um, we've got what else have we got? Um, Off-surface flows, optical methods, these are real game changers now with transom filters. Lots of different things you can do with that with background or engineer, past the image level symmetry, at least it's there. Um, and but also on surface colors, again, optical pressure sensitive paint, which is a really brilliant bit of kit from the most probably, particularly to like pressure sensitive paint. Uh, I mean, it's safer by trying to work out what's going on with three or four pressure transducers in a bucket of the cavities. Anything but uh, it's built on the high speed camera, and suddenly you've got more data than you know. Um, uh, but it is an absolute game changer in terms of uh, transonic energy. Unfortunately, most transonic winds are very good optical access, but people who these pesky walls that way, it's filled with bugs, or small, so quite difficult to get cameras and lights into. Um, pressure interpretation has got so much better than it used to be. Um, we can do flexible models for high speed testing that's starting to, uh, to become more routine. We can look at actually measuring model deformation. One of the problems we've got is that. You do your CFD, you do it on a, on a particular shape of aircraft, you put a model in the tunnel, you measure the pressure, the model deforms at the load. Um, and you can either guess the post deform, which is the old profile of loads, every model will have a code it. But now it's relatively routine to measure the deformation of the model in real time, even dynamic deformation. So you can pick out a kind of shape, sort of modes and things like that. Functional um, integration. Propulsion systems have got much more complex in terms of their interactions with the, uh, with the aircraft, the military and the civil aircraft. So we'll see this in some of their some interesting technical advances in how we do uh, in particular, as I uh, saw uh, over five means things like very, very small, high power motors for doing propulsion simulation. Um, what we control the data acquisition systems are just so much more uh, powerful than the handbook to the the that some of us are still using 30 meter ton. Um, the stuff you can buy off the shelf outperforms your state of the art um, built kit for 30 meter fly and all the energy. Um, so that's really making a lot of things possible. Uh, and then also, it's the big plus of it, but um, as you manufacture, people have been with models, but also we'll see it happen on balances. Uh, the NASA are already doing that with manufacture for models in the cryogenic model. This is a pretty serious uh, uh, loading case in terms of temperature and loads on what is there. So they're building uh, active manufacturing models and also they're looking at balances. So you can say goodbye to all those complicated 3D machining with wire and all sorts of stuff that are usually pretty okay. You really can make the problem with the gauge at the same time. So in terms of bringing in those things into the 21st century, who do you want NASA? Um, I'm going to pause it because um, NASA did go to the back here of COVID. Well, they've done some quite astonishing things in the last few years. So they went through the same pain that we had in the UK about COVID. Well, in a way, they did the closed tunnels, but they were a little bit clever about that. Well, it would be multiple than most of them. Some of them were demolished, but quite a few were just tucked away quietly into a corner and left until um, so we might have come into the game. Endless capability reviews. Over and over again, NASA do what national facilities study, RANDs did one as national or science and technology, something plan. 
Um, anyhow, the joint you know, uh, word salad. Uh, so the thing there is it kind of means they thought it was important. These things were important enough to have a review in the first place, rather than just shutting them. Or some civil servants somehow decided to give them the other and they go. They, you know, they spend a lot of money getting people in to look at the motel and look at usage, try and at least close them or revamp them on a rational basis. They care enough to think about it. Even if in the end they close them, um, they still care. And they certainly have any number of initiatives, um, which to be honest, half of the I've forgotten what they stand for, but it really matter. Uh, but you see, they thought it was important to review them and to have a go every now and then at doing something about their facilities because they saw them as national, of national importance, of sovereign capability. Um, and then the biggie is this thing called the new funding model of 2017, which is kind of just in quite them. It wasn't secret, it was published, but it didn't make possible. And uh, 2017, the third 2016, it said, okay, we need some of these facilities are sovereign capability, they're national strategic facilities, therefore we want people. Right. But we still have to say, 2016, we'll cover 50% of fixed costs for a, a subset of, of national facilities. 2017, we'll do 100% of fixed costs. 2019, we'll do consumables as well, if you're a massive user. They backed off on that one a little bit last year or so. That was a bit too expensive. But basically, if you're a massive user, those tunnels are essentially free. And guess what happened? What do you think happened? Everybody used them. That is right. These ones are going through the roof. Well, the weekly, we put the rice up and make things harder. And people stop using our facilities when we close them. It's up to the people on this one. They're going, I can. I can calibrate my facilities again. They've got facilities that haven't calibrated in terms of years. Uh, the UK facilities I'm thinking about are in the same position now. They're calibrating them, they're rebuilding, they're replacing the kits, they're putting new instrumentation in, they're, they're reactivating tunnels. Because they've actually got the money up front for these facilities. It is astonishing. So they're investing in their facilities again. They're investing, it's not just the facilities, they're investing in the tech technology, they're investing in the staff. They're investing in capability and how to they're actually doing maintenance um, on these facilities. But it was rather nice to walk around the five meters today to see a wind tunnel that is looked after. Um, uh, but there are an awful lot of wind tunnels that have had a very sad time over the past 10, 20 years. Uh, and this is changing in the US because of this, this program. Um, that includes the University uh, the uh, Unitary Plan Wind Tunnel, one of the Unitary Plan Wind Tunnels, the Ames, which is the, uh, the Glen uh, 8x6. The Transatlantic Dynamics Tunnel and, of course, the National Transatlantic Facility that applies in So, those are the four Transatlantic Tunnels that are covered by this, plus a number of other facilities as well. Those are the interesting bits. So, where is the UK in all of this exciting Renaissance thing? Yeah, I'm sorry. <laughs> well, let's have a look at what we've got to start off with. Um, there's no big ones, so we can go, we can go in closer, same plot, size against time, and you can see reds, red are closed. And uh, we are still running. Um, we have two left, two industrial scale tunnels left. Come back to more details. That's the AIA Transatlantic Wind Tunnel and the BAE's uh, High Speed Wind Tunnel, which is a four foot blowdown. Uh, also worth noting, these are the only supersonic facilities in the UK as well, of any significant size. There are no other supersonic tunnels left running. The eight foot's gone. AIA's 30 inch supersonic tunnel is operational. That's it. Those two tunnels are all we have. For serious supersonic testing. Um, fortunately, uh, my friend Tom up at uh, they've just managed to, to extend the high speed tunnel gap. It went to 1.1, there was a gap to 1.4, 1.5. It's close to the gap this year. So actually, at least the, um, the high speed tunnel will fill in some of the gap. But that's it. Um, what else have we got today? Well, you can see the kind of the uh, the depressing bit is all of these useful tunnels. Lots of smaller research tunnels, you can see this part of eight by six, which went. Um, we have a first tree foot, uh, went a uh, little bit left the back, is part of the compressor that's sitting over in Germany now, the back, the back of the war booty that's gone back home. Um, a whole bunch of air framer tunnels. Every air framer had a, a kind of 12 inch supersonic transonic tunnel, bottom quite crude, MGL. Seem to have dozens of them. Uh, mm -hmm. They seem to change day by day. You get some of the things there. Um, they've all gone. We 
have no two deep wind tunnels. The last two deep wind tunnels in this country disappeared last year. Uh, if you have what passion, but probably the same thing, but it's not an AI management. It's all no fun for people. Um, so what is left? Well, there are the, the, the small tunnels, the university tunnels. And we have basically six of those left. You can see that Liverpool has gone, Cranfield has gone, Queens has gone, City C6 has gone, and these are six. Um, got Manchester City, AOA Z4, which all have been there, and Cambridge is super tiny tunnel, which should have been some of them there. So two of those are part of the National Winter Facilities Group. So they are getting some support. The rest of them are just orbiting along as best they can. Uh, these are all tiny, four to nine inch. None of them are capable of serious range configuration testing. They're generally underpowered, not uh, short test periods. They're old. We look at the most modern whistle in the country. It's 1965. That's really quite shocking. 1965 is the newest time. And even that doesn't work properly. It hasn't gone supersonically because of an issue with the ejector. They're trying to fix it, but it's, they had, well, oh, sorry, uh, they have 50 years to fix it. They're going to get back to it now. Uh, these, these are very much first generation tunnels, and it does show in their, their capabilities at the end of time. So, um, just to quickly show the two, the two big ones that we do have um, ARA, I mentioned that as a continuous tunnel, 8x9, but test section, map 1.4, sort of pressurized, 1.2 bar. It's, uh, it's not a serious level of pressure. Very low spill, 22% perforable, no fields in that anymore. It's um, a model, quite a few. This tunnel really is showing its age. It's a good tunnel, but it is, it's showing the age of its design. It is a compromised test section design for its time. Um, it's usable, but it does have issues, and it is, it is it's been thrashed in 20 years. The other Big tunnel that we got would be a high speed wind tunnel, that's the ball that flow down. This was pretty much the first or second of this cut up on the end of the building. Um, it's essentially had no significant change to its configuration in that side. Everybody else who's got one of these has added stuff, put new nozzles in, and added ejectors to run uh, to reduce loadings, things like that. This one, until the last few years, has pretty much stayed untouched. Uh, they fixed the nozzle and refurbished the part in the last few years. But also that it's a, it's a classic, uh, again, anti flow there. In the universities, we got, we have a little one, Queen Mary, our classic is transonic because it has a perforated wall, but we actually haven't got the pressure ratio to go transonic. Uh, Cambridge's is about the only useful transonic supersonic tunnel in the country. We get a small Manchester have one, but if not, it's one point five, but it struggles to get there. For a decent sample from there, we have the city pad point seven. Uh, that, is, that is a very, very old tunnel. Uh, it is supposed to be getting more good. But 1951 is when it started, but it came over here at some point before that. ARA Z4, which is a little uh, uh, nine inch tunnel. Apple Country, it does have a flexible nozzle, but it's broken at the moment. Trivlands is basically an exact copy of that tunnel. Also has a flexible nozzle, but that can be a flexible nozzle. But it hasn't gone super sun for a relatively. And then there was the only other decent translate tunnel in the country, City T5, which actually has a deeper slightly bigger test section and a slight better capability. Uh, but it's still small. These are perforated walls, these are all soft walls. The walls are nice, mostly T6 at City, but uh, City Side Strangled in the five tunnel of boring. And they moved the maps up to the old tunnels that we visited for the first lap. Uh, I've got to say, the birds aren't making them drugs on the south of the family. Okay, then we've got, well, we've got a few tunnels left. What can we do with them? What I've got here is the currently usable test envelopes. Some of us have them and they're not. They have bigger test envelopes, but they're not, they're not in fit state to use them. So I've got us, well, I've got a Reynolds number divided by map. It takes that in the data straight lines there. Against map number. So this is, I guess, it's Reynolds number this way, map number this way, uh, and we've got all of those speed wind tunnels in the country sit down here. And the thing you do know is that there are no shortage of low speed wind tunnels. We've got loads of them. The country's full of low speed wind tunnels. We can build them even though we've got more than we need. There's the five meter sitting on here, survive. 
Here is um, an RA. Here is the four foot of water. This is from the bigger test envelope, but it's pressure wise. It's blown down, so it automatically bumps at higher total pressures than an RA, which proves as one that one to one point two. And then down here are our university facilities. Most of them have no capability to change pressure. They tend to have fixed nozzles. You've got two tunnels that are even capable of getting through the sun region, Cambridge is in sequence, but the other models are uh, there. It, everything else is on some sort. But also, what you can see right here is this huge gap in the middle. We've got sort of production tunnels, we've got flight Reynolds numbers up here, nothing in the UK that we do flight Reynolds numbers at high speed, but at least we, have, we are paying money into UTW. So in theory, we could use it, but it's, it's almost it's impossible for academics to get into the building. They can get into the pilot tunnel, PETW, um, which sits down here, but even that's tricky to do. It's still a very small tunnel. Um, but we've got, got my TRL, we've got low TRL, and then our mid TRL, where we try to do 3D for bigger action aerodynamics, flow control systems, reasonable rental numbers, there is absolutely not. That's the gap. Uh, this is where your classic 0.6 meter trisonic blowdown sits in here. This is the tunnel that every other serious aerospace nation has several of. 0.6 meter trisonic blowdowns, filling that gap where you can do serious missile work, you can do serious civil aircraft wing work at the university, you can use 3D, 2D, all of that, for example, shock off that shock angle interaction. Any number of people doing 2D shock angle interaction. As soon as you go to 3D, the slight wing is different. We love that. That ain't our way. It's a bit of an right? You've got different flow phenomena, you've got different natural frequencies, you've got different magnitudes. All of that 2D stuff is completely useless for 3D wing. Not the universities can't do 3D wings, so they carry on playing with the 2D. It's instead easy to get a PhD out of that. You can whack around and you can bear out the suction of bumps. But it's, it's, Building. It's not serious, useful work on what the country needs, what the what the what industry needs. <coughs> Sorry, that's my my France, but I'm quite <laughs> okay. That's there. Um, what did I do with the UK then? I mean, I'll be best doing things. Well, we have NWCF funding for research facilities, but this has very much been focused on either new low speed facilities and a handful of hypersonic. Um, very high speed, high end facilities in Oxford. The, um, the transonic tunnels have got a couple of bits of instrumentation, but we have no specific fundamental funding for the facilities. So that's the instrumentation. That's pretty much it. Um, what else have we got? PAB that puts some company money into their work as well. Most of that took in fixing what was broken, uh, which was the uh, nozzle drop vents and the part needed refurbishing. So that's, uh, that's really quite nicely. They've got They've got one, so they've, got, uh, they've invested in people, they are investing in capability there, they are doing stuff in there at the moment. So they are plugging away. ARA did put in some company funded work. Um, they put a new thing in the exhaust system in, in 2000, the old one broke. Um, they thought about doing a test and upgrade from 1.4 to 1.7 to spend the fortune. We bought a new compressor, we got a new fan, we got a new motor, and then we decided not to bother. Uh, so actually, the uh, motor, the motor has been sat in the warehouse for ten years. We kept turning over, so we had to pay someone to, to, to run the motor, just keep jacking the motor over. The sort of bearings and that, and that's basically been sold. The transformer that we did sat outside in the rain for another ten, fifteen years there. Um, there was some money from what was the UK Aerotonic Centre when it first started. We could make ATR, and they only got fifteen point five million out of that. Uh, yes, well, 15.5 million. Um, to, to be honest, it was an incredible rather mixed record what came out of that. Uh, I think ATI, both ATI and ARA need to share the blame on, on, on a number of other projects. We don't quite back them up. Um, some successes, some things are still going, but a significant number of technical papers or commercial papers. Um, and sort of as a result of that, ATI cut off funding to AMA around 2017, which just stopped. So the serious thing that needs to be done, UK acquisition system, 
refurbishments, um, control systems, plant, all of that, not a penny. So that would now, that, that's, that's, that's what ARA is. It's, it, it's, it's had money, but it's spent on stuff that we didn't really need. There's a gust rate that nobody wants. It's a BLB system that's been used once. Uh, there's a dry that doesn't work. Um, it, 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 it just went on and on. Uh, the, the, the project were invented were literally apparently overnight by the steam plant in particular. It's all the work that came. So it's that classic thing of short term funding body thinking and management and reaction. And they came up with projects that were not good, but spent a lot of money, but actually did not touch. The things that ARA needed to keep that facility going. <laughs> so that's the different parts of the question. Some things are more cheerful. One thing is that clearly we do actually need transfer point on the same update. There's a lot of things, even in the UK, happening all the time. We need transfer on the same time. There's a big stuff there. Tempest, uh, perhaps I should know the mosquito, obviously that's there, but something like it will happen. Uh, Air Armistice project there. This is a, uh, this is Crane, which is a kind uh, of advanced uh, flight control demonstrator vehicle, which uh, BA and March of people. Of course, the, the, the series book had done in the States, uh, Fly Zero, all that integrated propulsion stuff, uh, lots of missile things, flexible wings, uh, wings, wings, with all these things, transfer. For example, this is the Bristol project. All of the work so far that's been done that pretty much has been mostly, which is, which is nice. But given that the, the critical design point flight is transcendent cruise, um, it's, it's, it's a long way to go. And there isn't the university facility that can do that in. Um, so at the same time, we need to do all these things. But CFP still isn't there. I think isn't there by a long way for most of these complicated things. Barely there for cruise, still can't do high lift on a standard, standard wing. Um, so we're going to need the things to work together. Um, digital twinning is not going to be the magic bullet to fix this because a digital twin needs something to twin with. And if that thing it's twin, twinning with is not representative of the real, real world, we might as well not bother. Why isn't it happening in the UK? Well, first thing is there is actually no plan, there is no vision, no overarching national vision like we have in China, they have in France, they have in Germany, they have in America for ground test capabilities as. Sovereign capabilities, strategic capabilities. We have completely fragmented planning organizations. We've got ACI wants military stuff, you've got DSL contracts, civil stuff, DSL doesn't have any money, so they're all the turf war between them. Um, they're not that interested in some of industry, <coughs> not going to support the facilities. And you can say, why should industry? Because industry in this country is multinational. If you're BAE, from a commercial point of view, there's no particular reason why you protect in the UK. You could go to it. If you're an MBTA, you could test in France. The only reason testing this country is because there is a national need for it. There is a sovereign need. There is something you need to do that you can only do in the UK. That's not going to be a commercial argument. And that's where we fell down with Dell. Uh, we'll close tunnels on the basis of commercial arguments. And the technical needs get lost in the politics. So you can see that, for example, in the area of the center in certain days. Mm. Spent the first year just talking about who was on this uh, case. And it's essentially doing small on the language. Mm. So it's actually advancing aerodynamics. Uh, I left it so late that an ATI came in. Aerodynamics disappeared. So one of the pillars, which are pillar for about six months, and then it's gone. The pillars of ATI, it's no longer the primary interest of ATI. So the UK aerodynamics says that. Drop the ball pretty seriously on that one. Uh, we contrast now, I mentioned all the things that are happening in the States, that are happening in Europe, that are happening in France. Yeah. And also historically, things that we do in the UK, we have the NPL, we have the RAE, we have the College of Aeronautics, which says it has a national capability. Um, and uh, the Aeronautical Research Council, which is so successful in Americans, happens NASA, or NACA, previously in the back. We did have the biggest national bodies, we just have these. Uh, overarching plans and visions, uh, but we've stopped bothering. Also, short term outward thinking. When you do get flat funding, it's on one year funding, it's milestones, it's get something done in the next six months, make sure you're spending those lines for And uh, give us some pretty pictures. I have sat in reviews with funding of these and managers, and people have put pictures up. You show that last time, 
It's the same picture that you showed last time, but of course, a different way to do it. Uh, and our viewers are going to go, oh, that's nice. <laughs> Tick the box, yeah, give you a six for that because you, you pick your milestone, spend your money, you haven't messed around with moving around. Um, and, and that's that really won't get some new students to technical uh, arguments for not being appreciated by people coming here because they didn't have few people who were capable of doing that who were sidelined quite early on. Um, and so there was this focus on set piece, high profile projects, um, not rather than you know, investing in maintenance was not a thing you get money for. Boring day to day capabilities were not the fun. Yeah, that's something exciting, sexy, new, a trust free. Um, didn't work and nobody needs. Uh, a cavity brief was tested once uh, and published from one paper, and then nobody was interested in it. Uh, these sort of things. And then you've also got this kind of blame culture that if things do go wrong, you have to be able to stand up and say, that didn't work, we need to think about what went on and how we can do it best. But nobody, if you looked at the, the reports on all of these projects on the ACI website, would not know any of them any problems whatsoever. And you cannot advance if you can't admit that it went wrong. This is what's great about the STAI meetings. You go to them, people say, we really got this badly wrong. We put our compressor leg back on, we put the fan on backwards. We were wondering why it wasn't very efficient, so we know it's the arrow that pointed the wrong way. <laughs> that's a true story. Uh, and that was a very serious research organization. I may still have been to it. Not everyone went, you know, we did that, or we did something very how many people put something in backwards the first time they said it? And they said, yeah, we have to admit you got it wrong. Because then you move on. Um, otherwise, you stay shot. You lose your funding. You don't get any more. You see what's happened with the ARA, ACLA, and the funding. Because no one dares admit that it went wrong. And underneath it all, we don't have a supporting infrastructure. There is not those big range facilities and those research organizations to underpin the work to be done in industry. And to provide the staff, the, the up and coming new, new generation, test engineers, uh, of aeronautists. There's a gap. You can, you, you've got computational aeronautists coming out of your ears. You don't have five aeronautists with a connection to the real world. At least somebody can do a bit of both. Um, and I've seen this at work with uh, recent aerospace companies. And they're full of smart kids, they're very bright, but they're CFE oriented. And they're spending all their time trying to trying to really move their writing in-house codes to stop the whole by code for them. But they're not going to get right because it's an astonishingly difficult thing they're trying to do. Uh, but they'll spend all their money on CFD rather than bringing them together. Um, so no national aerospace research organization, no, no appropriate facilities. And again, contrast this with every other significant aerospace nation. Um, it's too late to catch up, but what can we do? We could learn from the rest of the world. We'd actually have a strategy, would be a start. Mm -hmm. uh, we could take a, a longer term uh, focus on this. An interesting example here is ADC, Arnold Engineering Development Centre, which operates uh, very large uh, transonic suits on It's got two 16 foot wind tunnels. It's just reactivated their Mac 5 16 foot supersonic wind tunnel. That's just come back online last year. Mm -hmm. And they're also running up a 16 foot transonic wind tunnel. But they have this thing about being the Walmart of Winston's. <laughs> Do things cheap and quick. And essentially, it went horribly, horribly wrong. Uh, and bizarrely, around about 2008, they kind of went, that didn't work at all, did it? We better do something. This. So they ended up and said, we got it wrong. There was an amazing paper that someone wrote that basically said, this wasn't right, and we need to do things properly. We need to think again about technical rigor. We need to think about this. And they stood their hands up and said, we got it wrong. And they went. I mean, it took a lot of effort, but 2018 to uh, sort of, uh, 2008, about 10 years, they've turned that around. They've gone from being a test house who were cutting things up, and um, they, they admitted to com compromising a multi million dollar uh, program. They didn't say what program it was because of data quality, because of the poor testing that they were doing. Uh, and they, they turned that around, but it's taken a lot of time there. Uh, so we could do that, but that would cost money. We need to properly support what we've got, which is ARP, and we need to build caps. But you know, you could have been spending 20 billion million pounds on ARP, not cheap. It has to be a national, it's never going to be a promotional team. ARA is never going to repay 
a third million pound rejection. It's only going to make sense that we don't want things to be doing this for our future best needs for our future industry. Um, and we need to re-establish that supporting everything. We need to get back to how to commit to our own research work going on. Uh, okay, I mean, let's talk about prosecution. To be honest, we need to have the RIE back, or business, or at least NPL, uh, with the intermediate summit. We're never, we're never going to persuade anybody to build another big summit or something. So it's doing it, Charlie's doing it, we don't the, the, uh, the industry doing it. We're not going to do that, but at least we can get that gap filled again. We can fix what we've got and we can fill the gap. But that would have to be something outside of the university. The problem as soon as you say this, the universities instantly are in there. It's a bit like that, so that scene from finding Nemo with a seagull, we're all having a go at it. Mine, 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 mine. Uh, and you're just getting people back in at the money. They'll all build tiny little things, they'll play with them for a couple of years and they'll get bored. It needs to be a proper facility, in a, if, if properly looked up and properly run, properly staffed. Uh, uh, we have been talking to people because of the sound of Fritz. One possibility, for example, is Dare Street, which yeah, uh, is one of the um, science and technology facility council basically, where there is already and the physics, you can pattern this out to the big physics facilities that are centrally run, that have permanent staff, that have technicians, that have permanent researchers, that have the support. Like no university in this country, for example, you would even afford freshman pumping capabilities of road transformers of any size. They don't have the, they don't have the land space for the tanks. They don't have the compressors of this. It's just it's a, 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 a sensible thing for a university to do, but it is a sensible thing for something like these uh, physics research establishments to pick up the East Coast. Well, that's where we're at with that appointment. Um, but actually, DSTL are sort of interested. They'd love to have a trisonic, low hypersonic wind tunnel, uh, but they're not going to pay for all the thing. So at the minute, we're keeping them all. We've got people at DSTL saying, well, why can someone park here? Yeah. Maybe you can find somebody else to stop the rest of them. So that's where we are on that at the moment. Um, so to summarise, on the more positive note, for the rest of the world, this is actually an astonishingly good time to be a high speed internet professor. Because there's a low screen. It's not a dying business. You can't get into most transatlantic wind tunnels, industrial ones, are booked up two or three years ahead. You can't get into them. Uh, there, you know, CFD has not really really significantly impacted on that demand. We've got as many or more transatlantic than we've ever had, but all work hard. That's work for people. That's, that's interesting work. Um, and that work has become a lot more complex than used to. We've also made that interesting. It's very relatively little now of the old handle turning stuff and just having a test engineer and just come up through. Uh, it started as, a, as, a, as an apprentice, and like the guest apprentice test engineers, but they're sitting there and they're just telling them to do the same thing day in, day out. That just doesn't happen anymore. People are doing test engineering in high school, we call that a much more part of the research and development activity. It is much more of a result of that activity. Um, globally, as I said, there was this uh, astonishing most it's new building tunnels. Um, numbers are going up to 40 big industrial transatlantic in the world at the moment. Um, it was about 60 or 70 uh, small research ones. And um, nobody closed it. And the other thing I mentioned there is the investment levels are going up. People have these tunnels in general, other than the UK, are investing in them and calibrating them, they're putting capabilities in, giving their access engineers lots and lots of lovely new to play with, which is a test engineer as well as the company to be. Uh, although, of course, you have to make sure that you're doing sensible things with those. So, obviously, you, you do get that, but there's that temptation to just, just to make some of the not hit there, obviously, you can test the data, uh, avoid that. So, was a bit at the end for most people. Um, oh, I've not even got to nine o'clock yet. It's a miracle. <laughs> um, so, so there we go. Thanks for listening. Uh, I'll take questions.